Howdy, 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 my name is Nacho Sasuke. Welcome back, let's read the SP Foundation Wiki. Sorry that I dropped off the face of the earth for a couple of weeks. Um, I don't really have a, an excuse. Just energy levels were not great. But anyway, in the last episode, we stopped at Predatory Street Art, I believe. So we're going to be starting with Wellington the Wonder Horse, and then the Bifurcating Man, Arboreal Jellyfish Puppeteers, the Wind Harp, and Effective Containment. So let's check out that there, Wellington, the Wonder Horse. Well, the Wonder Horse is safe. Wellington is to be housed in a stable adjacent to the secure outdoor testing facility at Site 73, and is to be provided with food, water, bedding, grooming, and veterinary care appropriate to a non-anomalous animal of its species. Wellington's stable is to be cleaned daily. Um, they may or may not be allowed supervised access to the secure outdoor testing facility for exercise and grazing purposes during daylight hours when no testing is scheduled. Any clothing changes exhibited by 1156 are to be documented and monitored. They're not actually a horse, are they? Well, it says they're a horse, but I haven't gotten to that part yet. Uh, SCP-1156 cooperation with the Foundation is currently predicated on its belief that it is a paid employee thereof. During good behavior, it is to be assigned a, a work of a low-priority nature appropriate to its abilities. 1156 is to be paid bi-weekly with script bearing a face value equivalent to the current UK minimum wage, minus legally permitted deductions for room and board, and is to be allowed to purchase approved sundries with said script from the Site-73 Quartermaster. Failure to cooperate with Foundation personnel shall result in suspension of the above privileges. The Foundation is to monitor sales and transfers of domesticated horses in the United Kingdom for any additional horses pre presenting 1156 characteristics. In the event that any such specimens are identified, the Foundation is to acquire the animal as soon as possible for separate containment at Site-73. Sorry, some, something in my computer keeps turning on and off and I'm not sure what it is. Okay, it's my mouse. Uh, give me a second. Okay. Um, let me do that one more time. That should be better. Um, sorry about the clicking noise of me unplugging the fan of my computer. The USB hub was being busted. So, um, description. 1156 is a male domesticated horse, Equus ferris calibus, of indeterminate breed and unknown age, approximately 1.7 meters in height. The tongue, palate, lips, and vocal cords are shaped in a manner not found in non-anomalous horses, allowing it to produce phonemes used in human speech. Uh, 1156's brain is approximately blank percent larger than the brain of a non-anomalous horse, and possesses several anatomical regions of unknown purpose or function. Wellington is sapient and is able to speak in English with a thick accent resembling that historically spoken by natives of East End of London, UK, Cockneys in common use, and claims to have been born and resided in the London borough of Whitechapel prior to its coming into Foundation custody. Wellington identifies itself as Wellington G. Wonder Horse, and describes itself as part of a, co a community of sapient horses living openly throughout the East End, a claim which has not yet been corroborated by Foundation research. 1156 has demonstrated a limited ability to manipulate tools and simple machines with its lips, teeth, and tongue, including an ability to write by holding a pen in its mouth. 1156 possesses a limited form of telekinesis, comprising an ability to dress itself by spontaneously manifesting clothing tailored to fit a large horse directly onto itself. That is not what telekinesis means. Uh, most frequently, this clothing takes the form of a silk top hat and a light blue scarf bearing the monogram WGW in gold embroidery, though 1156 has demonstrated an ability to produce other articles of clothing, including neckties of various styles, coats, eyeglasses, masks, heraldic banners, harnesses, bridles, and bits, and on one occasion, a re upon a request from research staff, a full suit of articulated plate armor. Clothing manifested by 1156 spontaneously disappears when 1156 dresses itself differently. The source of the clothing is ultimate disposition, and its ultimate disposition upon demanifesting is unknown. 
Forensic examination of the clothes themselves indicates that they are comprised of common fabrics and metals and bear no anomalous properties in and of themselves. Wellington was acquired by the Foundation in 2000-something following a raid on a country club in Redacted UK owned by Marshall Carter and Dark Limited. Wellington claimed to have been taken prisoner by them six months prior after responding to a want ad for coach horses and forced to perform various tasks for the guests of the club. Wellington describes itself as a professional coach horse and has been convinced at this time that the Foundation is employing him for that purpose. <laughs> oh god. Please state your name for the record. Wellington Garrett won the horse at your service, my lord, finest coach horse in the west of Whitechapel and that's no ill. And you've lived in Whitechapel your entire life, is that correct? Boy to the sound of the bow bell, sir, just like me old dad and his... Oh boy, him and his boy, him. We're old and proud lineage we are. <laughs> oh my god, this is awful, I'm sorry. Uh, my grandpa always said there's been Wonder Horses pulled folks around London since before they signed the Magna Carta. And there's, there are more horses like you. Yeah, fellow blighted ain't, aren't ya? Would it be ain't ya? Haven't you ever been to London? There's thousands of us all over the Joe. Millions, maybe. Not as many in me grandpa's day, sure. This is not written like he's speaking in a Cockney accent. It's almost written like he's speaking in a Cockney accent, but it's not quite there. Okay, uh... So, you wouldn't say there's anything unusual about your being able to speak? I've... I never met an horse that couldn't, my lord. And you're making clothes up here? Well, the boss gotta look dignified when he's working for room and board or... The Oxford and her kidney accident. Watch this then. <clears throat> Good morning, ma'am. How do you do? Shall we be heading to the chapel this morning? Mind your step. Dad started teaching me that when I was barely a youngling. A yearling. I was teaching me own oh, God forbids before I wound up here so they could take up the family trade when they're old enough. You have a family. Been married to old trouble six years now. We got three little ones now. Michael, we should be just starting school now. There's Emily and y'all yelling Gareth. He was already saying his first stickies when I got taken in by those Berkeley unit. Berkeley onset MC and D. And how did you find yourself in the custody of Marshall Carter and Dark? Well, work's been hard to come by these days. Everyone's gone horseless and there's not much to call for coach horses back in me grandpa's day. Amy's been helping out our local on Sundays, but with things being the way they are, I haven't got much work for her either. We've been behind on the Burton, and the landlord was talking about evicting us. Said if it weren't for the council breathing down his neck, it, we'd never have rented to own horses in the first place. Go on. So I sees this ad in the Times. Coach horses wanted for work in a country club. So I put on me finest suit, try on down to Knight's Bridge, and tell the man in the office I want the job. Did they hire you right away? I no, oh, that's a load of horse shit right there. Never saw, saw so much as five quid for six months straight. Told him I'd be writing me member of parliament. They just laughed and treated me unmerciful. I mean, this breakfast ain't exactly the full seasons, but it puts the village to shame. What sort of work did you, they have you doing? Pulling coaches, giving rides, serving drinks, magic shows, all the most embarrassing things you can imagine. Sometimes they get all the crowd together and bring in one of the ladies after she had too much tin to wink, and they want me to betray me marital vows with her. Right in front of them all gawking and laughing. Now, I'm not a church going off, my lord, but even I know a sin when I see one. Do you know where your family is now? Well, we always lived at Data Expunged Whitechapel, but they've probably been evicted by now. Amy will have sent the, ki Amy will have sent the kids to live with her sister in Shepherd's Bush. She's a good soul, but I just can't stand the way she puts on airs ever since she married that donkey. Is this the queer sort, no, I mean? I see. That'll be all today. Wait, could you send him a letter for me? I haven't heard from him since the Ampton Wicks got their hands on me. It's right in the corner by me, Trow. We'll consider it. Upon investigating the address provided by 1156, the Foundation found a currently uninhabited two-bedroom apartment. The building manager stated that the previous residents had been evicted six months prior and could not vouch for their current whereabouts and refused to discuss them in any detail, stating that they had been nothing but trouble during their entire stay. Okay, so Marshall Carter and Dark sounds like they're just basically, what if the SCP Foundation was run and controlled by a bunch of rich, terrible people with far too much money to know what to do with? And this, this kind of confirmed that even further than it already had been. Oh, Keter then. The bifurcating man is Keter. I should probably check to see what the word bifurcating means, huh?
What does it mean? Bifurcating. Gerund or present participle. Bifurcating. Divide into two branches or forks. Just below the Ky just below Cairo the river bifurcates. So he's the multiplying man then. Okay. All instances of SCP-1157 are to be kept in separate 3 by 2 by 3 meter quarters, connected to a secure common area in Sector 7. Curfew is to be enforced at 11 p.m. Eastern every evening until 6 a.m. the following morning. Security must consist of 12 armed guards trained in crowd suppression. 1157-1 is to be kept in isolated quarters and not connected to the main containment area. All staff working directly with any instance of 1157 are to maintain the highest level of information security. No mention is to be made of Foundation staff names, project information, or containment procedures within the 1157 containment area. Verbal communication with 1157 is to be kept to an absolute minimum unless authorized by Dr. Torres. No clothing or equipment used when interacting with the SCP can contain any identifying inf information. Personnel, including members of MTF Gamma 7, are instructed to carry only digitally encrypted forms of identification when involved in containment or study of 1157. Mobile Task Force Gamma 7, the Pied Pipers, has been formed to track down and detain any uncontained instances of 1157. Basic information, photographs, fingerprints, and DNA samples from 1157 have been distributed to major law enforcement organizations. Coordination with local government and other MTF units has, will be approved on a case-by-case -case basis. Lethal force has been authorized as a last resort. During a bifurcation event, 1157 personnel are to initiate protocol G7 before wake-up call. Description: SCP-1157 is a Caucasian male with brown hair and blue eyes. The subject's anomalous nature was first discovered when an instance of 1157 designated 1 surrendered to the local police in Blank, Arizona, claiming to be a member of a terrorist cell. When a bifurcation event occurred while they were in police custody, the subject was brought to the attention of the Foundation and transferred to Sector 7 for containment and study. At intervals of approximately four weeks, all instances of 1157 will undergo a simultaneous bifurcation event at 3.08 a.m. Eastern. While 1157 sleeps, each subject will split into two identical instances. The event is accompanied by a burst of light and energy which disables any recording devices. Any clothing or other items worn by 1157 will be deposited on the bed underneath the subjects. Protocol G7 is to be enacted immediately after every bifurcation event. The containment area is to be flooded with a gaseous sedative. A security team equipped with gas masks will enter the containment quarters and remove one of each resulting subject pairs for euthanasia, study, and disposal. SCP-1157 displays a limited form of shared consciousness. While each instance exhibits their own personality and can make individual choices, they also experience the surface thoughts and impulses of all other instances. Based on subject interviews at the time of 1157's initial detention, at least five bifurcation events had already occurred. During containment, there have been at least three observed events. To the best estimation, the current status of 1157 is as follows. 32 instances contained. 34 instances confirmed deceased. 45 euthanized during containment. 86 unaccounted for. Then there's an interview and then six incident reports. It's Dr. Torres interviewing 1-1. One -one. Forward. Following initial containment, the two instances of one were separated and individually questioned. Can you... I don't know what gender Dr. Torres is. Can you explain the nature of your condition, please? I go to sleep, and when I wake up, there's one more of me. And this has happened before. Eh, a few times. Last week makes five. There's 32 of me now. No, I, I, I will not. Is something wrong? <laughs> they can hear us, you know. The rest... They're not happy with me. You can hear them all. Yeah. Bunch of scared bullies shouting in my ear. I saw what they did. I saw what I was becoming. No, not me. You. I made a choice. Subject shuts eyes, breathes deeply. I'm sorry. There's, there's a lot of them now. It's overwhelming sometimes. I can imagine. Would you like some time alone? <laughs> oh, right. My apologies. Closing statement. Despite being in a separate soundproof interview room, uh, one, two was able to repeat the conversation verbatim. Incident report number one. Mobile Task Force Gamma 7 leader. Utilizing intelligence gathered from the interviews, MTF Gamma 7 successfully located and detained three more instances of 1157 before they could go into hiding. However, operations for the next several weeks turned up only empty apartments and dead ends. 
Once usefulness has diminished rapidly, as the other instances are now aware of his cooperation and are providing deceptive intelligence. Report 2. Following a second bifurcation event, one, now consisting of four separate instances, shows increasing signs of distress. An argument over one's complicity in Foundation activities resulted in a physical altercation and the death of the subject advocating against cooperation. All instances of one have been put into indefinite sedation to avoid mental coercion by the growing collective. Intercepting email correspondence between Luce 1157 allowed us to locate a safe house used by numerous subjects. Gamma 7 was met with small arms fire upon engagement, forced to terminate two instances, captured seven. Computers and correspondence found on the, prop found on the property indicate that 1157 is aware that an organization is tracking them, but they have no knowledge of the Foundation itself, requesting a cleanup team to scour the property for any other evidence of their activities. Report 4. Interviews with instances of 1157 reveal narcissistic personality and increasing distrust and contempt for anyone that is not 1157. The subjects have shown increasingly skillful attempts at tricking researchers into revealing sensitive information. Outside of one, the subject remains uncooperative. Agent Thomas was lost in our latest engagement with 1157 along with two other Gamma 7 members. The bastards have spent the last month training and stockpiling weapons. The warehouse we tracked a subject to held law held enough 1157 to outnumber us 3 to 1 all armed. Even after capturing 16 and killing 31, there are likely even more of them uh, unaccounted for now, now than there were when we first discovered them. I'm submitting a request for at least a tripling of Gamma 7's numbers and resources. If we don't lock this down in the next month or two, we're going to start seeing these guys on every street corner. The contained instances of 1157 attempted a riot to break out of Sector 7 immediately following a bifurcation event. Using their increased numbers, 1157 assaulted the Protocol G7 team. Reinforcements allowed security to resolve the situation, at which point Protocol G7 was completed without further incident. Containment procedures were revised and 1157 were restricted to individual quarters for one week. Five days later, each instance carved the following into the wall of their quarters. You cannot contain me. Should one escape your grasp, thousands will arise within the year. 05 Memo Request to have contained instances of 1157 reduced and number denied. Our sedated instances of 1 continue to increase in number. If 7 can sufficiently reduce the number of militant instances, we may soon have a sympathetic majority capable of converting the rest. Until that point, we want 1157 to believe they have the upper hand. So I guess the reason that one is keyed is because it's difficult to contain and they can just use surface level thinking to learn about the facility and then attack it. Arboreal Jellyfish Puppeteers. I'm not 100% sure what the word arboreal is, so I guess I should look that up too. What is it? Relating to trees. So, some sort of tree jellyfish. It used to say 14 instant specimens, but now it says 8. And it's Euclid. The 8 specimens of 1158 in captivity are housed at Site 19. Hazardous Life Forms Wing. In a 50 by 50 by 10 meter Lexan enclosure containing a rainforest habitat transplanted from, a, be transplanted from its natural surroundings. Habitat temperature will be maintained at 30 degrees Celsius. Embedded misting systems will regulate humidity levels at 70%. Full spectrum retractable sensor pods are embedded at 10 meter intervals in a grid pattern throughout the enclosure to observe behavior and feeding. The enclosure will be accessed through a positive pressure airlock for Enclosure and Habitat Maintenance said maintenance, blah, blah. said maintenance will be performed weekly by a team of three Level 1 personnel equipped with Tyvek exposure suits with set masking apparatus, accompanied by six MTF operatives armed with standard issue M1014 shotguns. Open flims are forbidden within the habitat. Feeding of 1158 will occur once every 21 days. Prey will consist of one live adult sheep. It used to say pig, but now it says sheep. Atmospheric molecular analysis systems are to be mounted throughout the habitat to detect the chemical markers of 1158 gamete deposits. All gamete deposits are to be collected for research. The deposits not used in research are to be incinerated. No breeding experiments are currently authorized. Description SCP-1158 is an airborne carnivorous arboreal predator superficially resembling a very large olive drab Portuguese man-o-war, particularly in its colonial polyp attributes. Known, let's see, known habitat currently consists of deciduous rainforest within a 500 kilometer radius surrounding blankety blank. Research on deceased specimens has shown that uh, the large 4 meter 
pneumatophore is filled with hydrogen, thought to result from bacterial decay, providing lift. While airborne, 1158 nestles itself high in the canopy layer, allowing its feeding and detecting polyps to hang down through the understory to the forest floor. These polyps are effectively camouflaged among the various vines and branches present. The dactyl dactylozooid polyp bundles are, to a limited degree, prehensile. 1158 has not been observed to at an altitude greater than the canopy emergent layer, seemingly preferring to remain silently hidden beneath the foliage. Prey appears limited so far to mammals and lizards with a mass of approximately 50 kilograms or greater. Once a victim makes contact with a dactylozooid polyps lying on the ground or adjacent to a tree, nemocysts in the polyp strands inject a paralyzing neurotoxin while nearby polyp threads wrap around the victim's extremities. Addendum. For reasons which have not yet been determined, all species of pig tested thus far have proven to be completely unaffected by the neurotoxin. Experimentation indicates that and ven venomation and envelopment take approximately six seconds. At this time, primary feeding polyps enter the victim's body through all available orifices and anchor themselves inside. Once anchored, powerful digestive enzymes are delivered which break down internal organs for absorption by the polyps. The process has been observed to last approximately four days with the victim expiring approximately two days after capture. During the digesting of the absorption process, if a captive subject is approached by other large vertebrates, it will stand on its hind legs and wave its front legs. If the captive is a human, this will produce a beckoning effect. Yeah. Specimens of 1158 were first discovered on blank blank 2000 something, approximately 400 kilometers from somewhere uh, during deforestation operations pursuant to the construction of the blank blank and the blank near the something river. Two days after several advance parties went missing, subsequent search teams located two party members seemingly at rest near the buttresses of a large seva tree. The two scientists were initially unresponsive, then appeared to be waving the search teams over for assistance. When approached, it was observed the two subjects' arms were suspended by very thin vines that were making them move. As the search team's medical personnel moved to assist, team members began stepping on and making contact with feeding polyps from several specimens of 1158 hovering nearby, at which point the specimens attacked, resulting in 11 casualties. Subsequent newspaper reports garnered the attention of the Foundation, which then moved to have the area quarantined. 14 specimens were taken into custody. Incident 1158E3. On blank blank 2000 something, 14 days after the specimens were placed in their habitat at Site 19, a domestic pig was introduced into the habitat to serve as a prey item. After several minutes of exploring the habitat, the pig became ensnared in the, the polyps as expected, but remained unaffected by the neurotoxin. Instead, the pig chewed through the polyps, severing them. The pig then seized the remaining polyps at its mouth and used them to pull the specimens from their canopy, at which point it trampled them to death and fed upon their remains. Six specimens were lost before the pig was shot. Dang. Okay, the wind harp. This sounds pleasant. It probably isn't. Oh, it's just sound. Info hazard warning. All information in this file must be kept in auditory form. SCP-1159 audio file. Note, I apologize for the informality of this recording. I was not able to use written notes. Okay. So I guess we're just going to listen to these then. I'll, I'll mute the microphone. Well, I'll, I'll see if muting the microphone makes the recording have a seizure. Item SCP-1159, Object Class Safe. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-1159 is to be contained in a box measuring 2 meters by 1 half meter by 1 half meter. The box is to be kept in a climate-controlled room at all times to prevent deterioration of the wood. SCP-1159, as a note, is an info hazard, and as such, all staff should be discouraged from making any notes or other written commentary about 1159 in order to prevent data loss. Description: SCP-1159 is an Aeolian wind harp measuring 1.5 meters by 20 millimeters by 30 millimeters. Carbon dating suggests that this wind harp is less than 200 years old. Markings on the underside of the harp indicate that it was manufactured in Herculean Greece, though no date is listed. Harps of this type are meant to be played by the wind with no human interaction. SCP-1159 will produce multiple harmonic tones when wind uh, or some other source of air is blown through the back of the harp, causing the strings to vibrate. 
An example of this harmonic tone is included in attachment one of this file. The anomalous nature of SCP-1159 becomes apparent when any person attempts to create any kind of written descriptions of the object. Any such attempts completely and utterly fail. Um, it's worth noting that referencing SCP-1159 itself does not produce the effect, nor do descriptions kept in a purely auditory state, which is the reason for the unorthodox uh, medium of this particular file. People who listen to SCP-1159 for some time often describe its music as entrancing and beautiful and such, but it is unclear whether or not this is an anomalous effect or whether the sounds produced by the object are simply high-quality harmonics. Uh, addendum 1. SCP-1159 was first discovered in an auction house on in New York. An elderly male subject mentioned to a Foundation agent posing as a customer while on standard containment patrol that he had a beautiful harp in the back of his shop. The agent asked for the price of the harp and the subject was not able to produce one, stating that he had not had an opportunity to write it down. He did note that that was an unusual occurrence, but he said that it was certainly just an oversight on his part. After determining the anomalous nature of the object, the agent initiated a containment protocol and uh, SCP-1159 was recovered. Ending recording. Addendum 1159-TAC-A. Attempts to write down descriptions of SCP-1159 have not been met with success. In this first test, subjects were given various mediums with which to capture description of 1159, including pens, pencils, cameras, typewriters, and computers. Upon initiation of the test, uh, no subjects were able to complete the task. Pencils broke, mostly tips. One pencil was found to have no lead in it. Um, Pens began leaking all over the paper. Um, two of the pens had their tips rupture. Uh, the cameras were also unsuccessful. The digital camera suffered corrupted files and uh, one suffered a short circuit. The analog cameras found that all of their film had been overexposed. The computers all suffered fatal malfunctions and uh, the typewriter suffered a mechanical malfunction including a broken gear and uh, several broken keys. Okay, so, so far it sounds like the reason that it's all on recordings is because if they try to make any sort of information about this at all, then it, um... It sounds like if they tried to write down the file about this SCP, then it would have just, like, destroyed the computer. Okay, let's listen to the rest of these. Addendum 1159-TAC-B. Subject was given a lead pencil created by Foundation engineers with the purpose of making a pencil able to write under extreme conditions. Pencil was created with lead alloy tip to prevent breaking and was wrapped in a titanium shell. Upon initiation of the test, subject suffered a fatal heart attack. Further testing has been suspended until further notice. End recording. Okay, so. Um, they, as they said, they made a indestructible pencil so that they could write down the information without the writing implement dying like in the first test, and instead it just killed the person who was trying to write it. I'm also mildly concerned that pushing the mute button on the microphone has messed with the video file, so I'm not going to press mute on the microphone this time and just try not to make any noise. This is Dr. Buchanan, audio log of interview with Dr. Androvsky. Dr. Androvsky is a Foundation researcher stationed at site and will give his opinion on SCP-1159. Thank you for joining me, Dr. Androvsky. My pleasure. You've had some time to study SCP-1159 and its anomalous effects. Have you formed any opinions as to the nature of the harp? I have. I believe that the reason the object behaved the way that it does, it's a form of self-preservation. How so? 
think of it this way. Eolian Windharps do not need humans to play them. The only interaction the human has with the harp is by listening to the music. If you take away that audience, the harp has nothing. You can describe a harp with words, certainly, but the anomalous effect of the harp forces anyone who wishes to learn about the harp to learn about it auditorily. Even if the person never hears the sound of the harp itself, the simple fact that information must disperse to sound is a music on its own. The music of information. Thank you once again, Dr. Androvsky. My pleasure, again. Okay, so that felt like they talked in a little bit of a loop, but it sounds like what they were going for is that, um... It sounds like what they were going for is that you can only know the SCP if you actually hear it. And the last audio clip is actually hearing it. And I'm just, I'm now really paranoid that me pushing the mute button on the microphone just made it not come back when I unmuted it. But it seems to still be working, so... Well, that sounded weird. I'm not going to try to like write down a description of it, but it just sort of sounded like somebody pushed two random buttons on an organ piano and just left it. I don't know if that. I don't even really know what a wind harp is. Is a wind harp a real thing? Let's find out. Well, they, it seems wind harps are real things. But, um, before I continue, I'm going to take a second to see whether or not the, the microphone is working. Okay, everything was fine. I didn't, I didn't lose a whole chunk of the video by doing the mute buttons. I don't need to worry about that anymore, but I was, I forgot to test it before I started recording. But anyway, that brings us to the last entry for today's video, which is the effective containment. After I delete that video, or, uh, link. What the heck? Why does it look like this? It used to be Keter, but now it's safe, but why does the website, why does the page look like this? Are these links to everything that the Foundation has? The Foundation has a deviant art? Huh. Weird. But anyway, um... SCP-1160 is currently contained via Foundation Protocol Tango-77. Foundation assets her to maintain surveillance of 1160's area of captivity. Changes in the behavior or appearance of 1160 are to be reported to the off-site containment team at Site-95. In accordance with Protocol Tango 77, the distribution of the Super Cocoa Pals brand of breakfast cereal has been allocated to Site-95, which also currently oversees marketing and manufacturing. Any deterioration of the Super Cocoa Pals brand is to be considered a level 2 info hazard emergency. And here is 1160 before initial containment, date, image dated August 15th, 1915. Alright then, SCP-1160 is a massive paranatural avian entity located beneath Mount Somewhere near someplace something 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 on Somewhere Island someplace. Despite being roughly 85 meters in height at time of recovery, due to the effectiveness of Foundation Protocol Tango 77, as of September the 11th, 2014, 1160 has been reduced in size to a size of roughly 25 centimeters in height. Recovered documents indicate that the entity referred to as El Rotanero by the original inhabitants of the island appeared in 1765 and began a series of aggressive attacks against the fishing villages of the island. Because of the anomalous traits of 1160, the inhabitants of the villages were unable to properly combat the entity. From a collected manuscript found in blank 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 blank, translated from the original Spanish, the buzzard came again last night, larger than before. Its cry we heard first, the great gnashing of a terrible demon. It appears not like the mainland creatures, 
but something far worse pulled from some devil's pit in eons past. The buzzard tore through our defenses, and we had no choice but to flee to the sea or take shelter in the earth and pray that it would not root us out. Every night that the buzzard returns, he is more and we are less. While 1160 can sustain damage, it is for all practical purposes considered indestructible, as 1160 is capable of rapidly and fully regenerating lost or damaged tissue, and is able to withstand all forms of conventional firearms or explosives below 300 kilotons. Additionally, 1160 has a, virt a number of insect-like optical organs situated around the head and back, capable of providing the SCP with a virtually 360 degree perspective of the area around it. I lost my spot by looking out the window, I apologize. Uh, the, these traits combined with the natural brute strength and speed of SCP-1160 make the entity particularly deadly in close combat. However, it is also negatively affected by human cognition, a trait that has been manipulated by Foundation Protocol Tango 77 to provide a comprehensive long-term containment solution for 1160. The rate at which human perception of 1160 increases is directly related to the rate at which it undergoes system systemic biological decay, and the number of individuals who are cognizant of 1160's nature is adversely related to its overall size and strength. This effect, however, is not instant and seems to take place over the course of several hours after initial cognition. While it is believed that 1160 could feasibly continue to decrease in size indefinitely, the limits of this effect, if any, are unknown. Addendum. Protocol Tango 77. Okay then. During an initial discovery of 1160, a team of Foundation scientists hypothesized that the sudden sharp drop in aggression by 1160 was in some way related to the arrival of Foundation personnel on the island. On August 13th, 1943, after routine uh, amnestic cycling of Class D individuals assigned to Site 77 on the island, it attacked both the Foundation facility and a nearby fishing village. During the attack, the entity was noted as being highly aggressive and notably larger, inadvertently resulting in the loss of blank Foundation personnel and blank other inhabitants of the island. In response to this discovery, Foundation assets were allocated to the creation of Protocol Tango 77. The project, codenamed Saturday Morning, was begun with the intent of spreading awareness of 1160 to a large, consistent group of human subjects, which would in turn weaken and aid in the containment of the SCP. In 1953, after a 10-year period of development, additional trial runs of the protocol were enacted. On May the 14th, 1953, a Foundation Front Company, Standard Products, released the Super Coco Paws because, of course, um, breakfast cereal, which began mar marketing heavily towards children. The mascot of the brand was Bradbury Buzzard, a cartoon character caricature resembling 1160. This character was featured prominently on the front and back of the box, itself containing a number of subtle anomalous memetic triggers intended to plant specific pieces of information concerning the nature and appearance of 1160 into the consciousness of its targets. Which was, initial triggers were reverse engineered from existing memetic phenomena such as 2061, 2076, and Red Talisman. Over time, these triggers have been adjusted slightly to avoid over-proliferation of sensitive information, and the most recent product surveys have returned positive results. Where once consumers were replied that Bradbury Buzzard is a mean buzzer who lives on a secret island and hurts people, consumers now tend to respond that the character is a mischievous little bird who lives on a tropical island and tries to nab super cocoa pals from various young children. So the way that they were able to contain the deadly 85-meter-tall vulture was by making everyone think of him as a friendly little bird from a cereal box, and now he just is a friendly little bird from a cereal box. Okay, sure, why not? So, this has been Anashi Sasuke. I don't remember what number episode this of this uh, Let's Read series. In the next episode, we'll be checking out a how-to book, A Hole in the Wall, Face Swapper, Echoing Epitaph, and Minus Level. If you liked it, a like and a subscribe would be groovy. If you didn't, you don't need to do either one of those things. If you want to click the bell, you can do that as well so that you're notified of um, future uploads. And I will see y'all in the next one. Later!